Hey, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, or good evening, depending on what part of the country you are joining us from. I'm Jason Bowman, uh, APA. I'm joined by uh, Billiards Digest publisher, Mike Pinozo. Mike, good evening. How are you? Everything's good here. How are you? Yeah, I'm good. I'm good. First off, well, I mean, I mean in addition to how are you, first off, Mike, where are you? What is the uh, the uh, isolation scenario where you are? How, how's everything going? Uh, well, I'm in Chicago, and I'm working out of the house uh, now. Uh, we were in the office all last week getting the last issue of the magazine put out. and um, But now for the next week or two, I'll work out of the home exclusively. And uh, we're on pretty good lockdown here in Chicago. Um, and it's, uh, it's, it's interesting. It's, you know, it's kind of like everybody else's experience, kind of a surreal experience uh, to be in this kind of situation. But, Absolutely. Uh, you know, we'll make the best of it. Yeah. Now, are you down in the city? Are you are you like in in downtown Chicago? Yeah, yeah. right downtown, about uh, you know five blocks from Soldier Field, right, right near the lakefront. Oh, okay. All right. So on on my end, we're here in uh, in Lake St. Louis, just about a mile away from uh, APA's uh, international headquarters. Here, uh, we've been shut down since last week. Um, have spent the better part of the past weekend inside here in my home with my wife and uh, my three year old, my six year old. So. Uh, it's a little crazy. They are, uh, you know, tough to keep up with during the day, but we're managing just fine. But you're right, Mike, this is, this is kind of a, not kind of, this is definitely a crazy thing we're dealing with. Not something that, that either of us certainly have dealt with in our lifetime. So we thought we would, uh, you know, we'd get on here and talk to you guys just a little bit about how this is impacting, you know, the sport of pool. Um, obviously this thing has much broader implications on the world. Um, and I'll talk about that in just a second. Before we dive too far in, Mike, I do want to mention a good friend of, of both of ours, uh, the Black Widow, Jeanette Lee, wanted to uh, give a shout out to her. I know she's having a hard time right now. She recently had, uh, of course, she suffers from a lot of back and spinal issues and recently had uh, a spinal surgery. Uh, it's my understanding they put some type of implant in, in there and uh, has had some complications, had to go back into surgery, implant removed. And so she's been hospitalized, obviously not a great time for that to occur. So we do want to, you know, if, if she's tuning in, we want to give our best wishes to the Black Widow, Mike. And I know you, you've known Jeanette a long time as well. Yeah, no, she was, uh, I, I really feel for her. She's always battled through pain. She's such a tough, tough woman. Um, and she was really excited about the latest procedure that they did. She was feeling like she was going to get back to the table and and take another crack at things maybe and and be more active. Um, you know, the the one thing that I take out of it is it sounds like it was uh, something that the surgery was successful. Maybe that an infection, you know, kind of followed things up. So if it's if it's something that they can get cleaned up and put that. Uh, a piece of equipment back in that stimulator or whatever it was back into her back maybe she'll get that relief again uh and and you know it's just a minor setback that's what we can hope for yeah hopefully so and and uh you know generally we probably wouldn't share somebody's medical issues on a on a live stream but of course uh she's been real vocal about the the issues that she's dealing with and, and a lot of that stuff has been put out um by her fiance gene allen um kind of letting people know and trying to, I think, lift Jeanette's spirits because obviously she's hospitalized, but these restrictions, um, you know, I don't know that he can get in to see her. I don't know that anybody can get in to see her. And, and so that's a difficult situation for anyone to deal with. And so we wish her the best and uh, hopefully she'll be on the road to recovery soon. Yep. Uh, so as we get into our conversation today, again, we're going to be talking quite a bit about how this, uh, this uh, pandemic, COVID-19, is impacting the sport of pool. But before we get into the conversation, I, I do want to kind of preface everything we talk about today. Obviously, there are a lot bigger issues that are going on with COVID-19 in the world than how it's impacting pool. We we fully understand that. Um, this is not to minimize, you know, the, the health scare or the, you know, the people that are getting sick with this or, um, you know, anything of that nature. But, you know, Mike, you've been in, in the pool world for for decades. I've been in the pool world for decades. And, and so this is what we do. This is what we talk about. And I know we've got a lot of folks at home uh, with a lot of time on their hands. So we thought, you know what, let's get online. Let's talk to the people kind of about what's going on with our sport. Um, obviously, a lot of the sports world has been impacted by COVID-19. We saw the NBA, NHL, Major League Baseball all shut down, March Madness uh, canceled. But this thing has, has really touched already quite a few 
uh, billiard related events. And, and we'll get into that. But before we do, I just want to pick up kind of where we left off. Last time we talked to Mike, uh, of course, we were coming off Team USA's second victory in the Moscone Cup. Very exciting time in December. Mike, a lot has happened uh, since we last spoke in terms of the Moscone Cup. And if you would, just maybe touch on some of the, the bigger happenings in the pool world this first quarter of 2020. Yeah, certainly a lot has happened. Um, from the Moscone Cup standpoint, the biggest thing obviously has been the, the change in coaching, which um, a lot of people saw you know, from the European side, it was pretty evident there was gonna be a change. Uh, Marcus had been there for four years, he had won twice, he had lost twice or five years, he had won three times and lost twice. Um, and, and it was obvious that, that they needed to mix some things up there, not that he had done a poor job, but, you know, just maybe change things up, get some new attitudes in there. Um, and so they announced Alex Laley and Carl Boyce as a captain, a vice captain. Uh, the Europeans, you know, it's something that comes with the territory in losing is the Europeans have been complained the last two years that the Americans had the benefit of having a vice captain and the Europeans didn't. And... Marcus was hamstrung by that and, and yada, yada. But, um, but it does level, you know, the, the, the playing field from a coaching standpoint. And that, that vice captain has become an important part of the, the process because it's, um, it's become such a big event. It's become so important that the role of the captain is completely different than it used to be. And so it's become so important that you need to have that second in command to set up drills while you're putting together lineups or while you're, dealing with one of your players that you need to handle individually, you know, the others aren't just run off by themselves. So um, that, that vice captain become very important. And uh, Alex Laley, I thought was a fantastic choice for team Europe. Um, you know, he studied, he, he, he grew up playing under Johan uh, for, for several years. And he's a very, very sharp, very smart guy, um, very analytical and, you know, he's one of the best announcers, you know, in the game. And one of the interesting things that I think you'll notice on this whole uh, change of captaincy this year is you've got Jeremy, who got picked to take over for Johan for Team USA. You've got Alex and you've got Carl. They're probably the three best commentators on, on televised events. Uh, everyone loves them because they're so – sharp and they're so in tune and they and they really think the game well and they play the proper way uh so it's kind of like it imitates other pro sports where you see these these guys who are the best former players the best guys in the in the booth are the guys you think boy they would make great coaches they would great make great managers you know because they know the game so well and these are three guys in carol and alex and, and jeremy who fit that bill perfectly uh, so Alex is, has become more of a coach coach uh, beyond just knowing the X's and O's. He's become very dialed into how to deal with players mentally and the different personalities the players have and how to get through tough times and over hurdles. He's, he's learned that element of the game, which Johan was so good at. That's what I think makes Alex so strong for Team Europe. And Carl is, is a very good player. He's kind of comical on television and, and you know, he's, He's that type of guy, but it's, I think it's good to have a guy with that kind of rapport with the players as well. He's played in many Moscone Cups. He's won four or sure. five times. Um, so it's, it's a perfect, I think it's a perfect blend for, for Team Europe. I think that, they, that that makes them stronger. If nothing else, just the talk of it making them stronger makes the players more confident. So the players will be on them are going to feel better going into this year already. So the U.S. got has their work cut out for them. Uh, Jeremy... Uh, you know, working under Johan the last couple of years certainly has learned a lot about how to deal with the players. He watched Johan do it. He's got his own ideas. He's a very smart guy to start with his, on his own. Uh, so he's perfect. His, his choice of um, Joey Gray, who's mostly a one-pocket bank pool player, more of a road player, gambling player. Um, his choice of him took some people by surprise, but, you know, a captain's got to know who he's going to be most comfortable with, who he thinks – knows the way he operates and can, they can work well together. Um, and he believes he has that in Joey Gray. And, and you know, I'll take his, uh, his word for it until, you know, Joey proves me otherwise. Right. Yeah, it wasn't a name I was uh, – you, you mentioned some folks took him by surprise, took me by surprise, not a name I'm familiar with. But what I do know of, of Jeremy Jones is 
smart, very smart guy. Uh, you know, I think Team USA will be in good hands. And if Jeremy's got confidence in him, I think we can all have confidence uh, that he's the right pick for the job. Uh, so you mentioned Jeremy Jones, now captain Team USA, uh, Joey Gray, vice captain for Team Europe, Alex Laley, uh, new team captain, and Carl Boys, uh, assistant captain. I'm curious if you had a chance to talk to Johan at all, uh, and if you were surprised. Uh, I, I know last time we talked, it seemed like maybe you thought Johan would be back. Maybe I took that the wrong way, but I'm curious if you've talked to him and if you were surprised that uh, that Johan is not leading Team USA. Um, yeah, that was kind of a um, a little bit of a confusing situation because he had mentioned that he wanted to be in for three years and see what he could do in those three years and then reevaluate. Um, he'd always been kind of a one year at a time guy uh, when he was coach of Team Europe. You know, he said, you know, sign me for a year, let me prove my worth, and next year we'll see if I want to do it again and if you want to have me back. Um, and uh, I think that he threw a little bit of a wrench in it at the end of this past Moscone Cup by saying that he might want to come back and some of the players wanted him to come back. And, and I think that mentally, uh, Matt Room and, and part of the Team USA had, had kind of already had one foot out the door, so to speak, thinking, okay, we're going to move on. And then all of a sudden, Johan wanted to jump back in. And, and I think Matt Room just made the decision, you know, let's Let's go with what we thought we were going to do this year. Let's move on to a new player, Let's a new coach. Um, let's have an American coach coaching the Americans. That was a little bit of a bone of contention when Johan first got named, that we had a foreign coach coaching America. Right. So um, it's just a good um, – it, it, it's, it's a good progression, I think. Um, you, know, you know, I don't think anyone will ever match Johan's uh, record, um, and I still think he's the best coach in the world. Uh, but I understand – where Matchroom's coming from and where the team's coming from in terms of, okay, let's, let's try a new path. Yeah. So if you're just tuning in and, you, and you're watching our discussion about how COVID-19 has impacted uh, the sport of pool uh, and you're wondering why we're talking so much about the Moscone Cup, I, I think this discussion will, will frame kind of uh, the discussions to come uh, because one of the big changes that Matchroom instituted this year, at least for Team USA, was – uh, now it's not a captain's pick of all five players, right? It's, it's, I believe it's two based on points now, three captain's picks. And as we start talking about some of the events that have been uh, affected here, some of these events were, were going to be points events for the Moscone Cup. So, um, you know, just wanted to touch on it. And what about Team Europe? Is that same kind of qualifications there? Is that the first three are points based and then two are selected? I don't yeah, know if they changed that. Yeah, this year what, what Team Europe's doing this year is um, relatively similar to what they've done. Uh, two captains picks, three uh, points picks, but they have they used to have this uh, combination of world rankings and European rankings, and the top player on the Euro Tour automatically got in. And um, this year they're, they're going with just this accumulation of points and events that Matchroom has picked out. It's the Matchroom World Rankings. It includes their events and includes other events. Um, and the top three will still come from that, but it'll be from one list. Number one, two, and three will get picked, and then there'll be two captain's choices. Uh, so it doesn't it hasn't changed dramatically. Uh, I think, you know, if you looked at it, the most obvious change to me is that by taking the Euro Tour out as an automatic berth, it's eliminated some of those players who are really strong in Europe, but not so strong on an international field. And it kind of points to, you know, guys like Alex Zakis the last couple of years or, or right. guys who are really, really good players. Um, but, you know, in an international field, you always felt like maybe there was one or two European top European players who got left aside because that Euro tour took up one guaranteed spot. Mm -hmm. um, so that's the most obvious, you know, that's the thing that jumps out at me quickest on the change they made. As far as Team USA, yes, there'll be um, uh, two spots based on points, I believe, and three spots based on a captain's pick. Um, but you know, let's let's be let's be honest. <laughs> If, if Shane's not one of the top two point getters, you know, it would be a miracle. And Sky would yeah. probably be one of the, or Sky or Billy or someone would probably be one of the other two. Right. Um, and then you get three captains picked. So essentially to me, 
Team USA is still, for all practical purposes, five captain's picks uh, because Shane's an automatic number one. So, so, you know, unless someone completely out of the blue comes in at number two, you're still going to pretty much have be able to pick last year's team if you want to, if that's what if that's what Jeremy wanted to do. So I don't see that changing a lot. Um, I, I have spoken with um, with Emily Frazier from Matchroom, CEO of, of Matchroom Multisport, and and she was the one who came up with this whole new plan for the Moscone Cup and the points and the captains and all that. Um, and and I think that the how this how some of the events that have been postponed how that affects Moscone Cup rankings, I don't think has been determined yet. I think it's something that she's going to just, you know, everything's still pretty fluid at this point. Yeah. So it's something that I think she'll look over over time and just say, okay, how do we how do we restructure things? Or, or if we do run a couple of these terms that have been postponed, do we just take the regular points? You know, do we have a cutoff date where things are getting too close to the Moscone Cup because tournaments toward the end of the year are really going to start to pile up now? Right. Um, so she'll have to make those kind of decisions, um, but I, I'm sure what they'll end up with will be something that that will be very um, equitable for both teams to make sure they've got the opportunity to get the best players in the Moscone Cup because, you know, this is a business for them too. So from a promotion sure. marketing company, right. they want the best teams out there as well. So <laughs> they'll make sure that happens and it'll be equitable, and every pro will have a chance uh, to get to make that team. It's just going to be the structure might be a little different. Yeah. So the other the other big news that came in in early 2020, kind of you know pre the the COVID uh, pandemic, was also Matchroom related. They acquired or a, uh, I don't remember if they termed it an acquisition of the World uh, Nine Ball Championship, the WPA World Nine Ball Championship, big event typically held um, in the Middle East. I think is is where it had been held, Qatar or somewhere like that. But the, but that's a that's a big deal. And can you talk just a little bit about about that and what that means overall for um, pro pool fans? Um, similar to their acquisition of the U.S. Open, I think it's, you know, their acquisition of the U.S. Open Nine Ball Championship and, and the World Nine Ball Championship are the two best things that happened to pool in, in the last, you know, I don't know, five to ten years. Um, because it, it it just gives so much credibility to those events. Um, you know, there, there's so much hope among the players that these events are going to grow to what they should be. The U.S. Open, I mean, it always had credibility, and so did the World Nine Ball Championship. And and for many years, the U.S. Open was was a beautiful run event. But now taking it to a matchroom level, which we all know just lifts everyone, uh, lifts the players, lifts the the notoriety, lifts the visibility, lifts everything, lifts the prize money. Um, you know, that's those are just great things. The, the, the World Nine Ball Championship had become really a s second to the U.S. Open for sure. It was not one of the premier events in the world anymore for the last three or four years. The prize money had gone on in Qatar, had gone down. Uh, they did a very poor job marketing it. There was there were never any fans there from a player standpoint. It was an awful event to have to endure. It was just the prestige of the title. Um, well, now Matchroom takes that over, and it's the prestige of the title with, with all the visibility and television and marketing and fans right. that go along with other Matchroom events, right? So, uh, so it's 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 one of the great things uh, to happen to pool. Um, yeah, and and you know it's it's Matchroom. You know they they want the best events. They're they're yeah. event promoters. Mm -hmm. uh, this gets them into more open fields or larger invitational fields, but. They're event promoters, and these are the biggest events in the sport. Um, and that, so that's why you saw them. I don't know if many people noticed that they they basically rebranded both of those events as the U.S. Open Pool Championship and the U.S. and the World Pool Championship. They're not right. referring it to nine ball. Uh, and I think it's a very strategic move on their part to have – they don't even have to, to say what the game is. They just want you to know that this is the biggest event in pool. The World Pool Championship, and this is the biggest event in the United States, the U.S. Open Pool Championship. Doesn't matter what's nine ball, eight ball, if it's a match room event, and this is this is going to be the biggest that there is. Um, and so that's the, the you know great moves going forward. Very exciting. Yeah. So uh, you know, I think I think what it means for viewers is you can expect to see uh, better production. You know, uh, cooler looking event, more exciting uh, looking event. I think they've shown that with 
obviously the Moscone Cup and, and some of the other events that they do. So definitely an exciting thing. Um, but as we transition into March, of course, uh, which is kind of, Mike, the beginning of really a lot of, of pool activity kind of kicks off in, in March and really takes us through, uh, you know, the summer. And, and now with the, uh, the world, uh, the world championship, I believe that's in October. I mean, you've got from March through, you know, with the international open and, and all those things, you've got events that, that kind of line up from now through, uh, October. And so here's where we start getting into issues. Uh, you start with the diamond Las Vegas open being held a couple weeks ago in Las Vegas in conjunction with, uh, some other, um, large scale events out there. And this thing starts becoming, you know, obviously we've been listening to the news for, you know, the last several weeks, some folks a little bit earlier, uh, into January as this thing started breaking out in, in China and, you know, we're kind of watching from afar and it's not a big deal here. Well, suddenly this event kicks off and the president goes on, on national TV and says, Hey, we're, we're putting travel restrictions on all those folks coming over from Europe and, and getting back to Europe. Right. So, uh, I immediately saw at least one player, Niels Fyen, that had to basically withdraw from the event and try to get home before these travel restrictions were put in place. And I don't know how many other professional players this impacted. I mean, what was your take on on kind of how that all how that all played out? Yeah, it was well, it was you know like we're going through with with everything in, in the cities that we live in, with the jobs we're working. Um, things change day by day. It's just this fluid process uh, that it's been. And it was the same way out there. I mean, you're, you're right. March was like the kickoff to this huge year in pool. It was it was starting with uh, the Diamond Las Vegas Open and going to the World 10 Ball Championship and then followed up by the World Pool Masters. And then you jump into the, the U.S. Open 9 Ball, World U.S. Open Pool Championships. That was all between the beginning of March and the middle of April. <laughs> so that was going to be a pretty good yeah. swing. Um, and, uh, yeah, as... as uh, Things changed around the world and restrictions started to come into place for travel and things like that. Um, it caused a lot of uncertainty and there were a lot of players very concerned for, for, for good reason. Um, were they going to be able to get home? You know, um, there were players who were considering staying in the U.S. after the World 10 Ball Championship all the way through to mid-April with the U.S. Open because... Right. Travel restrictions would have meant if they went back to Europe, and in the meantime, they wouldn't have been able to come back to the U.S. for the U.S. Open. So I think that was one of the things that caused Matchroom to pull the plug on the World Pool Masters so quickly, was because anybody who flew back for the World Pool Masters was not going to get back to the U.S. for the U.S. Open. And so a lot of those things started to come into play, and uh, um, the travel ban wasn't in place. It was in place for Europe. The continental Europe, but not for the UK. Right. Um, and then a day or two later, that changed, and all of a sudden, the restrictions on the UK. Well, that puts Matrim pretty much out of business for for April's event as well, because their whole crew, television and staff, everybody's come from the UK to the US for the, for the, for the US Open. Yeah. So uh, from the player's standpoint, um, you know, Niels has a, a family back home, a wife and two kids, and. And, you know, he, the thing that he wanted most, they had already canceled school in Denmark um, and he wanted to get home to them and sure. be with them. totally understandable. Absolutely. Uh, there were other players who were just did, wanted to be out of Vegas because there was just so many people. Um, right. That was a touchy subject too. So, um, you know, it was a really kind of chaotic, I think every day things were changing by the hour. Yeah. And uh, so for a lot of players, it, it just got to be a little bit too chaotic. Or else, okay, you know, left a little bit of Torsten Holman left early. Um, as soon as the Diamond Las Vegas Open was over, he got out of town. Um, and, uh, you know, it was really, um, I really felt for Ozzy Reynolds and the CSI people and everybody dealing and the Predator sure. people dealing with the Diamond Las Vegas Open and the, the, the World Ten Ball Championship because they were, they were caught in the middle of all this happening. It, yeah. It's really early. It's really easy to say beforehand everything can be fine. And afterwards, we should have done this. But uh, I think they did the best they could on a daily basis. Yeah. Um, there were so many players who were already there. Uh, it was it was really kind of a they, they were in a no win situation. And, and the health of everyone, I think, was you know first primary on their minds as well. But they hadn't been 
told her he hadn't been convinced that things were that critically dire that people get right. to town up to a certain point. And uh, uh, so that was a it was a it was a rough rough you know week or ten days for sure. Yeah, I I can't imagine. I mean, I mean, we know at APA all about running those big events, and I, and I cannot imagine having that kind of hangover. And, and like you said, two weeks ago, I mean, we knew this was a thing, but it seemed like each day that went by, it, it got bigger. I mean, it started basically two weeks ago tomorrow when the major sports started shutting down, right? NBA, NHL, we talked about some of those, and it just seemed like day after day, uh, this was this was just growing and growing, and and I can't imagine having you know, players out in Vegas and, and trying to run an event or trying to decide what needed to happen because it, it, you know, it just brings more questions, right? Well, what happens about this and what happens about that? So I, I do really feel for uh, all those that were involved in, in that situation. So once we got through the, uh, the diamond open, right, we had the predator uh, world 10 ball was scheduled to take place. I think well, maybe like 10, 12 days after that, that event goes down. Uh, you mentioned the Whirlpool Masters. That is a matchroom event. That takes place in Gibraltar, right? That was mm -hmm. slated for the end of March. That goes down. Uh, the next event to fall, I, I believe, was the U.S. Open, also a matchroom event, as you mentioned, scheduled in April. Uh, we had the Super Billiard Expo, uh, which takes place up in the, the Philadelphia area, uh, mm -hmm. which is you know brings in a lot of amateurs, professionals. I don't know if they still do a pro event at that tournament, but I know a lot of pros turn out and, and play in the different events that are offered there. Uh, so that's significant too. I mean, that's a, that's a 25 year old or 30 year old event in, in and of itself. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, these events, like you mentioned, I mean, we got into March, you had this whole lineup of, of stuff. And for years here in the United States, we've talked about, we need more professional events, uh, big table, nine foot table events. And, and here is the year 2020 where, we've got them all lined up and, and this thing comes along and just, you know, knocks us all backwards. And uh, it's, it's, it's gotta be frustrating for these event promoters. I mean, obviously APA knows all about the impact that this is having. Of course we had to cancel just last week, our pool player championships. That's our event that's held uh, at the end of April, early May um, brings about 3000 people out to Las Vegas. And, you know, we really struggled over the decision. I mean, we were meeting, day after day after day kind of analyzing the situation and figuring out you know what is what is best and also trying to evaluate and and look at what is going to happen 40 because at the time it was like 45 days out you know so we're trying to figure out do we cancel this thing now do we wait a little while we've got contracts with the hotel that has you know clauses about getting out you know for acts of god and that kind of thing that had to be looked at so it was a very tricky situation because at the end of the day I think we all understand how important these events are to the people that have qualified for them or signed up to participate in them. And so you don't want to act prematurely if you don't have to and cancel an event because the last thing you want to do is cancel something that's a month out only to, to have this thing, you know, start to fade away in a couple of weeks. Obviously now it, you know, that, that certainly looks a lot different, but again, two weeks ago, 10 days ago, we just didn't know it, it has changed so much. Yeah, it has. Um, and it will continue to change. We just have to kind of stay on top of what's, you know, um, be ready, be nimble enough to, to make decisions go, going forward. I mean, I, I hope, you know, we've yeah. all got hope that, um, you know, in a, in a short period of time, everything will be bit somewhat back to normal and we'll start to kind of pick ourselves up, put ourselves back together and, and, and get back into business. So, um, you know, I think one of the things that, you know, you talked at the beginning about how, there are bigger issues in the world than pool. Sure. Uh, we don't want to minimize or trivialize any trivial, trivialize anything. But by the same token, I think that it's important that people in various communities stay in touch and keep each other's hopes bolstered and absolutely and, and talk about common threads, things like that. And and, sure. and pools a community. And so right. um, I think that you know it's it's great that you know the one. One of the benefits of social media right now is that everybody is able to stay in touch. Sure. Um, and I've seen things online about, you know, ghost ball, you know, ghost ball pool leagues and, you know, online <laughs> and, and video challenges online and you right. know, play the ghost online against this guy for, you know, money or not money or whatever the case is. And, and I think that those things are, are just good to keep people engaged, to keep their minds, um, you know, not always dwelling on negative things. And, um, and keep them involved in something that they love, which in our case is cool. 
Yeah, and that's that's been important for us from an from an APA perspective. I mean, we talked about. I mentioned we were looking at the cancellation of or postponement of the pool player championships, and it, the the conversation quickly went away from that event into what about local league play? I mean, this has impacted every league throughout the country. APA across the board right now is is shut down, and and the impact that that has is one, you've got three hundred something league operators, and that's just APA leagues that are that are no longer running. They're no longer. Uh, and, and for a lot of them, that's how they feed themselves, right? These are businesses that we're talking about. You've got event promoters that, that in a lot of cases have lost deposits and things like that. Um, you've got bars and pool rooms that are just going to get hammered with this thing. I mean, you know, most bars cannot sustain a four, six, eight week shutdown um, intact. You know, they operate on such thin margins. So this thing is, is not, we're not just talking about professional level pool and its impact. This is impacting the sport from the grassroots level uh, of amateur players all the way up to the professionals and pretty much every business entity um, in between, if you will. Yeah, no, it's, I mean, this is, um, you know, every press release, every notice I've gotten from a club that I am involved in or, or a business I'm involved in, or whatever, they all start out the same thing. That this is unprecedented times. Yeah. Um, it is. There's, there's, this is fundamentally different than anything we've been through. Uh, you know, we've been through, um, you know, national shutdowns for the, for the most part, like 9-11. Um, right. But that happened quickly and, and shut everything down to a halt, but rebounded relatively quickly. And then you had recession, and, which was took a long, you know, several years to kind of happen, and then several years to get out. This is kind of a combination of both. This is something that happened like right now and it's going to have a, a really profound effect um on everybody you know for 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 a good chunk of time um <clears throat> but the you know one of the positives about it is that everybody's going through this and so you know we we go through it together and we find ways to get through it together yeah. um, as a billiard industry we'll figure out a way to get through it together i mean every like you mentioned every step of the way every integer that's involved to trickle down on who it's affected and how it's affected them it's it's affected everybody and it's affected them financially and, um, you know, pool rooms and, and the bars that, that have pool leagues and you know, food businesses that go with them and the guys who sell queues and the guys who sell tables and the guys who install them. And everybody's affected by this. Um, and to a certain extent, you know, uh, that it's good that everybody's affected because that that does tend to cause everyone to rally around each other and to help sure. each other out. And, and so provide some understanding too, you know, it's, right. it's the, you know, everybody's going through this. These are kind of remarkable circumstances. You mentioned technology and, and I think that's an interesting point because could you imagine having gone through this 20 years ago when we couldn't stay connected through social media and, and have the, the video messaging and, and all these different tools that we really have at our disposable now to, 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 to be able to stay connected to each other. I mean, I just can't imagine having gone through this 20 years ago. No, this would have been this would have been a tough thing to take, you know, yeah. 20 years ago. I mean, you know, I don't even know if I'd been able to watch enough television to keep me busy. You know, <laughs> uh, so yeah, to be to be holed up like this 20 years ago without social media, without the accessibility that we have to each That's other, crazy. and and things like that would 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 really be tough. So it's something that you know, like I said, we try to take advantage of. Uh, you guys are doing a great job staying in touch with all with all your members and pool fans and yeah. um, the pool fans out there and social media are all in touch with each other. And you can tell that it's all very, all in a very supportive way. Um, and so it's, it's all that kind of, you know, um, what we need is, which is, which is our friends telling us, listen, it'll be okay. It's right. Easy, you know, but it'll be okay. Just, just be safe and, um, um, you know, be focused on, on what's going to keep you and your family safe. And, and we'll worry about the other side of what when we get there. Yeah, I think one of the things that we recognized pretty quickly when we knew that the, the leagues were going to have to go offline for a while is, you know, a lot of people that play pool, at least on the amateur level, Mike, they, they play not necessarily to go to Vegas or, or you know, for the, the competition side, but for the social side, right? I mean, it gives them an outlet to, to get together with other people. And, you know, when suddenly we are now not just, not playing pool, but we're, we're isolating ourselves in our homes. Um, one of our biggest concerns were, were those people that, you know, may be really socially isolated, you know, those that live alone or, you know, their only outlet for social activity was, 
um, their pool league. So what, what we've really encouraged our members to do and anybody that's tuning in, I'm going to encourage this again. And that is to reach out to a teammate, uh, a fellow pool player that, you know, whether they're elderly, they live alone, they're, they're just not a, 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 what I'd call a social person and just make sure they're all right. Cause this is going to be a tough, a tough thing to go through, especially if you're living alone or, or that kind of thing. I mean, you, you really need to be able to connect with people somehow, some way. And uh, certainly we all have people like that in our lives. So kind of keep that in mind uh, if you're tuning into this. Yeah, absolutely. I think those are all really good points. Um, so we've talked a lot about the U.S., the impact on the United States and, and the events here. Um, have we seen any, and I don't know what you know how much you might be tied into what goes on internationally in terms of events. I mean, we talked about the World Pool Masters. Are there any other uh, large events, Euro Tour events that, that have been impacted by this uh, in the short term? Yeah, I mean, you know, I, I don't, I haven't spoken to a lot of people in Europe about your Euro tour events. I, I assume, you know, since most of Europe is, is on shutdown, that, that the Euro tour is just at a standstill for now. Um, you know, events in Asia, I imagine, are, are, are shut down as well. Um, so, you know, it's going to, it's, it's affected everybody around the world. Um, and it affects the players from around the world. I mean, there were a lot of players from Taiwan who were here for, for this event. Some of them gone back, some of them stayed. I know Josh Filler is still in, you know, from Germany is still in the U.S. <laughs> yeah, um, I saw a live so, stream of him the other day playing somewhere. So Yeah, he, he was playing James Aranis in Roy's basement out east. And, and um, you know, he and his wife are just decided to just stay in the U.S. Um, you know, it's... People are having to make those decisions because really is for, for professional players, um, you know, everything's just on hold. So yeah. it's just stay where you're at, do what you're doing. Um, you know, Shane Van Boning's in South Dakota <laughs> ice fishing. You know, yeah, like, he looks like he's in heaven. Shane looks like no person, problem. person in the world right now. So, you know, and, and he's, <laughs> you know, pool professional pool isn't a day-to-day you know, I have to play this. It's, it's an event by event. So if all these events just get postponed and they eventually happen again, he'll still have the exact same opportunities to make the money that he had. You know, so hopefully, you know, he's smart enough, and I believe, I'm sure he is, to have money school away that he can he can stay on his lake and ice fish for a couple of months, and and, and it won't affect him much. Um, so we, we, we should all be so lucky. Now, do you think a lot of these events, do you think we'll see a lot of these events get rescheduled later in the year? I mean, here's the challenging thing with that is, um, I mean, at least I know from our perspective, talking about the pool player championships is number one, you don't know how long this thing is going to last, right? This is like this an indefinite, indefinite period of time where we just don't know. Um, but then you, some of these larger events, you start talking about what kind of hotel space is going to be available later in the year. I mean, when you're talking about a smaller event, it's one thing to reschedule, but when you're talking about the U S open or the APA pool player championships that take place in major Las Vegas casino hotels, this is going to be a little more challenging to try to get these things on the calendar. Well, it's going to be challenging for sure. Um, you know, I think people would assume, well, Matchroom, you know, they're, they're the, you know, the, the 900 pound gorilla in the room. So they'll do what they want when they want to do it. Well, possibly not so because they have to deal with bigger venues and they also have to deal with, with their television partner, Sky Sports in, in the UK, their primary right. television sponsor. You know, once everything gets back up and, and rolling, there are a lot of sports other than pool that have been dormant through this period of time that are going to try to rush schedules through the second half of the year too. So, you know, even from a standpoint of television programming, there's going to be a glut of that out there. Is everything going to be able to get fit in? Um, So, you know, these are things that, like you said, everything is still changing data. We don't, we have no idea how long we're going to be in the situation we're in now. So I think most of the, the, promoters are just taking a, you know, a step back. Let's let this thing start to play out. Let's see what's available later and then uh, start to plug in what we can when we can. I mean, there's a lot of promoters who, um, you know, don't know whether they'll be in the same financial situation six months from now that they, they were in beforehand. So, sure. um, so a lot of this, a lot of this cause and effect is going to uh, take a while to shake itself out. We talked a lot about it at the outset of, of this discussion today. Um, the positive momentum that that really professional pool, at least in the United States, had. Do you see this slowing that momentum at all? Um, you know, it, it derailed it a little bit. 
Um, I think that that once we get back into rolling the professional events, um, you know, because they're different than leagues that are an ongoing thing, where they're just these are just these one-off events. I think they'll actually be a little bit easier to put together back together um, than than people like yourself who've got you know weeks and months of of scheduling and, and events to try to work through to get mm-hmm. to it. But the, the pros that they find one week in Vegas at the end of October, all you have to do is show up that one week in Vegas at the end of October. So right. I think the professional side of it will, will um, if the promoters are still willing to put their tournaments on, uh, will bounce back, you know, seem, relatively seamlessly. Um, you know, and we hope that it's that easy for everyone else. Yeah, and, and then in terms of just the long-term impact to the entire sport, not specific to the professional side, but obviously there there are the there's the manufacturing and, and homeroom side of of pool. There's the amateur and league and tournament side of that. There's the professional. I mean, what long term? You know, are we looking at? I, I know I, I remember I was just coming into APA when nine eleven happened, and and obviously that impacted quite a few things. Uh, I think for several years to come. What what do you see in terms of what this does to our our sport and our industry overall? Um, boy, it's a it's a, a tough it's one, a, right? You know, tough question to answer. No softball questions here, yeah, Mike. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, yeah that, it's just going to take time. I mean, it's we have to see how much damage has been done by the time the shift happens and we start turning back to some sense of normalcy. Yeah. So, uh, you know, for manufacturers and, and, and people who have products made overseas or products made here or, or distributors who buy products, it's going to be such a guessing game as to what the rebound is going to look like. You know, right. you, you know, how much are you going to order? When are you going to order? How, you, they have to look into the future and see, okay, if I have to bet what business is going to be like three months from now, four months from now, I have to make decisions based on that now, mm-hmm. uh, the product and services. Um, that's going to be, a you know, each company is going to handle it differently. They're going to handle it their own way. Um, you know, uh, you just hope that they that they see enough glimmer of hope in the future that they're that they can be a little bullish on it and, and say, you know, I think everything's going to come back really strong. The players right. are going to come up back in droves. They can't wait to get back to the table. They can't wait to buy that new queue. Um, you know, we get everybody with some job security back. That's going to have a huge impact on it, um, you know, with unemployment figures and things like that. But, you know, how is that going to rebound? So, and a lot will be up to the government on, on what kind of help we're going to get to, to be able to rebound. Um, yeah. So, you know, the industry, it's, it's, it's way too early to tell what's going to happen in the future there. Um, but this is an industry that's been around through <laughs> a, for a long, long yeah, time. Yeah, and we've yeah. seen, you know, more than our fair share of ups and downs over 100 plus years that the people have been playing pool in this country. So um, I just, you know, figure that it's going to find a way like it always has. The one thing that keeps me hopeful is, you know, once we've all been in our homes for weeks hopefully not months i i think people overall are going to be uh anxious to get back out into the world uh interacting with others it's kind of funny because you know you look at what social media has done over the last decade or, or so and how it's you know we've kind of gone from a, a from a we've gone to a, lo- a less social at least in person kind of society because we've started to live through some of the social media but i wonder if this kind of reverses that trend and we see people wanting to interact on a more personal level once again um uh, it'll be interesting to see you just, you just don't know i'm hopeful that that once this thing passes people are ready to get back out and i'm hopeful that the pool community is ready to embrace uh new people and try to get even more people involved because it's going to be vital i can tell you it's going to be vital to your your bars and your pool rooms i mean they're going to need business very quickly um you know some of your your leagues that that are your smaller leagues they're going to need people playing quickly uh, your tournament promoters are going to need people signing up for tournaments. So, you know, the, the one thing I think our audience can do, if you if you love the sport of pool, as soon as you can, get back out there. As soon as you can do it safely, right? Obviously, we're not asking people to, to risk their health or anything. But once they say, hey, once our local governments tell us, hey, it's time you can go back out, I would encourage people to, to grab your cue stick and, and get on a table as quickly as you can. Yeah, I think once uh, social distancing is is – a thing of the past. There's gonna be a lot of hugging going on in pool rooms around the country, and and we play around the country, and with pro players get to see each other again, and and uh, you know it's <clears throat> this is a sobering time. So yeah. um, 
I think when when it, when we are able to you know respond and get back out there, I think you know the pool community will will do what it does best, and that is be that very social, outgoing, out there group that we are. Uh, so you know, I, I I have high hopes. Yeah, who would have thought um, you know pulling us apart and, and making us stay away from each other would actually bring us all kind of closer together in the long term. So I uh, hope is, is out there and I hope that our viewers have some hope as well. I know it's tough times, but hang in there, folks. We're all going through this together. We're all in it together and we will all uh, eventually get back on a pool table together when the time is right. So Mike, I, I don't want to keep you any longer. I know you've got the nightly okay. cocktail that you've got to make up. What's <laughs> what is before I let you go, what is Pinozo's? Uh, of course, Mike has been making a special cocktail once each evening through this. What is the cocktail for tonight, Mike? Uh, the cocktail tonight is a, uh, a silver gin fizz. Oh, silver is, gin uh, fizz. A little gin fizz drink with a little egg white in there, shaking in there to give it a little bit of body, a little, put a nice little foamy head on the top of it. And uh, yeah, I tend to be more of a gin guy than anything. And I, it's, it's been kind of fun to just make one cocktail a night, you know, something a little bit special just for nice. grins and post it online. So I've been having a little bit of fun with that. But I only have my one a day. That's it. Nice. Well, I hope I hope you and I are sharing a cocktail sooner than later and we get through this thing. Um, the, the one thing I do want to do, folks, is I want to make sure Mike's not going to plug his, his publication. But if you would, <laughs> Billiards Digest is the top billiard publication in the pool industry. I would encourage you all to subscribe. Mike is a small business owner as well. He's going to be impacted by what's going on with COVID-19. So go to BilliardsDigest.com. Subscribe today. Uh, let's help him. Let's help anybody we can in the industry. And uh, as always, Mike, we, we certainly appreciate you joining us. We look forward to, to talking again um, to our viewers. Thanks for tuning in. I understand the president is getting ready to make his daily address. So we will bid adieu to our audience for now. And uh, we hope to see you guys again in the very near future. Thanks. Take care.